it's officially six cones. Yeah, it, right, exactly. Right. <laughs> that, must be, that must mean it's six. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get started with the uh, Transportation Advisory Board meeting of March 11th at 6 o'clock. Um, let's do roll call, please. Chair Lehner. Here. Board Member Wicklund. Here. Vice Chair McKee Burroughs. Here. Board Member McInerney. Here. Board Member Kim. Here. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the uh, approving the minutes of the preceding me uh, meeting. Any comments on the February 2024 uh, minutes? I have just a few minor comments on <clears throat> minutes page 2 line 22 I think it should read Tebow properties owns not runs on minutes page 4 line 30 uh, BNSF not DNS and Minutes, page 10, line 38, uh, our intention, not out intention. Not working? All right, anytime I have something to say. Here, just tell me. comments if we can get a motion to approve the minutes with those corrections motion to approve Same thing. I'll second all those in favor say aye Yeah, we are. This is great. I'm Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Just to let you know, we have some quick communications you'll see on your in your packet or on your packet, I guess. There's a little handout at each one of your desks for the agenda for tonight. And one of the items is just to remind you that on April, in April, excuse me, in April, we will be moving the TAB board meeting from the 8th to the 15th. So please don't show up here on the 8th. That would be, that would not be good. Um, but we'll be here on the 15th doing our regular business. We've, we're so busy we can't really cancel. So um, good for, for you all for keeping us going and, and the work the work plan is pretty well f filled up. So wanted to let you know that. A little update on microtransit. You may have heard in the news. Um, I, I think there's a story dropping today. Actually, it's just, just came in is we just received a million dollars from congressionally directed spending. It was kind of a long shot, but we thought we'd just apply and see what, what happened. So we applied for some money and uh, looks like even with all the turbulent things going on in the federal government these days that the Congress will pass that or has passed it and it's now on the president's desk for signature. So once that happens, uh, that money will start flowing directly to Longmont. They used to be called earmarks, and I think that was a problem with a lot of people to call those earmarks. But they are the idea about earmarking dollars directly to your district. And so I think a lot of different people saw that benefit, and so we're going to be recipients of that as well. So that's exciting news. Um, so that goes with the $1 million that we have from the partnership program from RTD, and then we budgeted about $648,000. So it gives us a pretty good um, starting point anyway for microtransit. So we really wanted to try to be as successful as possible early on and so that people will become early adopters. So we'll see how that goes. Um, also on your desk tonight is the uh, handout that we had for the recent Amtrak demo train or special train that came through town on Thursday. We were pleased to have the governor and uh, some pretty high-ranking officials from Amtrak, some pretty high-ranking officials from BNSF, 
some pretty high ranking officials from the Federal Railroad Administration on that train to kind of see what that route looked like. We probably went half speed, so it was a slow train. Um, got up to about 49 miles per hour, I think, top speed between here and Boulder, but um, it was a huge success. Uh, everybody seemed to really see the benefits and understand that um, if there's a way to do this sooner, and there should be a bill that's going to drop later this week in in the state legislature about how to fund more of this front range passenger rail part one, which is really Denver to Fort Collins, and then part two would be the south leg down to Colorado Springs and Pueblo. So some in interesting and exciting things happening right now. Um, we also wanted to just let you know one last thing is that, well, not one last thing, but before we do our last thing, I just want to make sure you're aware that in tonight's agenda, we need to move info item A, 6A, the US 287 Vision Zero Safety and Mobility Study recommendation, recommendations to our action items. So we'd like to ask you for action on that tonight. And if that's okay with the chair, we just wanted to check in and make sure we can make that change. Yeah. I. Concur with that. Okay. Thank you very much. So we'll be moving that item. You'll see that info item letter A, first info item will be the transportation mobility plan update. So we'll do that right away. And then there's one thing from Kyle. Or maybe more. <laughs> uh, just one thing for tonight. Kyle Howarth, uh, Traffic Engineering Administrator. Um, in response to, I believe, either January or February, I believe Chair Lanner was asking about speed radars out on Clover Basin. Um, we placed those out. Um, a few weeks ago, we we're collecting down those and we'll be reviewing the speed data and integrating that into our um, action plan for Vision Zero, um, as well as just south of 9th Avenue on Alpine. And so those will be out for a few more, probably another week or so, and then we'll be rotating those out to uh, more locations where those have been requested. Great. Um, and I think in lieu of the uh, public invited to be heard, We've got uh, an email that uh, Diane was able to print for everybody. And I think we've kind of decided, let's make comments to that email on our comments at the end of the meeting, um, rather than kind of hash it out now, because I think everybody's got a copy of it. Phil, is, do you have any issue with that? No, that works well. That's exactly what we would do if, it was, if the person was here in person. So we couldn't address what they were telling us, what telling you directly. You could do it at, at the end. So thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's move on to the. Um, oh yeah. Any public here that needs that would invite it to speak? And we're doing five minutes. Oh, we allow five minutes for the board. Wow. Thank you for hearing me, Transportation Advisory Board. My name is Diane Christ. Um, I just wanted to remark about the Amtrak pulling into Longmont. I just wanted to remark on how well Jim and Kyle and their staff cordoned everything off, got in with the, the key personnel there to make sure everything went, ran smoothly, and our own Phil Greenwald rode the train from Denver all the way here. <laughs> I have a good picture I'm going to send to you, Phil of you stepping off the train. I think that, um, it just in looking on the internet, that was the first time we had passenger train in Longmont since Roosevelt pulled in to, to do his politicking. So that was fairly impressive and important. And uh, feels like maybe we may eventually have rail here coming through Longmont. So, woohoo! Uh, all the other counselors are at National League of Cities. So I'm filling in just to take notes and share what's going on in the board arena. So anyway, thank you for all that you do. And I'll, I'll try to represent everything I hear here at our, at our study session. All right. Thank you so much. OK. No more public? We can move on to the information items. And since we moved A down, we'll go to the TMP update. Is that correct? I think so. Well, good evening, members, or chair and members of TAB. Just wanted to introduce Carly Seif uh, from 
Farron Peers, and she's our consultant team lead for this project. And we're very excited to have her explain a little bit kind of where we're at and where we're going. So thank you very much. Thanks, Carly. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. So just an overview of what we want to talk about this evening. Um, quick project recap, a little bit of background of, of what's led us to this point today. And then we closed out community outreach on March 1st. So wanted to share our initial findings, um, who we talked to, and some of the main themes we heard from the community and from stakeholders. And then I'll share some existing conditions, a snapshot in time of transportation today in Longmont, and then talk about next steps. Um, so project background, most of you probably know this, but just to um, kind of catch us up to, to where we are now. So the first multimodal transportation plan in Longmont was in 2005. The most recent plan was in 2016 as a part of Envision Longmont. That was the MTIP, the Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan. Obviously, a lot of changes have taken place in the last eight years, both in Longmont and across the region. So um, thus the need to update the transportation plan. So we've seen evolution of the demographic in Longmont, changes in travel patterns, changes in technology, changes in how people want to use transportation, and most importantly, uh, a kind of a reprioritization, a, a great desire to walk, bike, and take transit in Longmont and regionally. So I want to make sure that the transportation plan has a set of infrastructure projects as well as programs and policies that reflect this change in community desires and the change in the state of transportation. Um, so an overview of the timeline and planning process for the transportation plan. Uh, so we kicked off last fall. Uh, we started with an existing condition snapshot that I'll share with you today and uh, kind of the state of, of the practice um, and reaching out to the community. So we call this the existing conditions phase of where are we right now? So both on the data side as well as on the qualitative side or what are the community's needs and desires today? Uh, how do they see their kind of current travel patterns but also their latent demand? So how people would like to travel but unable to because the infrastructure or the programs aren't there today. Today. So we're just wrapping up uh, that phase one and moving on to phase two, so that right column. Uh, so we are compiling everything we heard from the community and synthesizing those existing conditions to come up with recommendations. Those recommendations are going to be very multimodal in nature, so talking about where do we want to fill in sidewalk gaps, upgrade deficient sidewalks, add new bike facilities, upgrade bike facilities that exist today but aren't considered low comfort, uh, make enhancements to transit through first and last mile connections, bus stop amenity upgrades, microtransit as, as Phil referenced, and then come back to the community and say, here's what we heard from phase one, here are our draft recommendations, is there anything we're missing, does this capture um, kind of your vision and goals for transportation, and then wrapping up that document in the fall and winter of this year. So a summary of community outreach, many of you participated in that, so thank you for, for your role. So we ultimately got over a thousand touch points of engagement. It's hard to say if we heard from uh, the same person a few times, so don't definitively want to say over a thousand people, um, but those touch points were provided a, a great cross section of the community, residents, visitors, employees, and we captured that input through uh, many different mediums. So we had in-person engagement in an open house um, just next door at the library. We had virtual engagement uh, through a survey as well as an online web map where folks could drag pins to the map and let us know where they have challenges crossing the street, where they want to take transit. So we'll see a summary of those spatial recommendations. And then we also have a steering committee that we've been working with um, of people kind of on the technical side who are able to advise from their various agencies um, or departments as to how we can move the transportation plan forward. So the goal of this phase one of outreach, as I mentioned, is to make sure that all of the existing conditions data is correct. We're filling in the gaps in that quantitative data with qualitative data. So where we don't capture volumes, we're understanding where people want to travel. Latent demand is a really great example of that. Um, and, and then being able to inform those recommendations kind of set the stage. So walking, oh sorry, and then one more piece of where 
taking um, kind of focused outreach to specific groups. So Center for People with Disabilities is a great example. We went to the Economic Summit to talk to employers, large employers who really understand what are the barriers to recruiting or to getting employees in Longmont. Um, we're speaking to the Latino Chamber of Commerce as well as obviously various boards and commissions. Um, the ECAT uh, as well, equity group um, representing folks who are monolingual Spanish speakers, lower income populations, we were at Bike to Work Day. So uh, those who we didn't hear from the general public making focused outreach over the next month or two. So the spatial comments we got in that online map, um, I think there were, say, go back and to that pie chart um, in the, the 200 range, we got over 400. And we got over 400 survey comments. So you can see it broadly covers the city. Each different color represents a different mode. Um, so we have breakdown of, of those heat maps by mode as well to understand those locations uh, where we're hearing specific challenges. But to just show you the heat map of all comments, um, unsurprisingly, downtown is a big cluster as well as the larger intersections of Ken Pratt where we've got kind of multi-lane, higher speed um, intersections with sometimes com complex geometries uh, on pace, some of the commercial nodes there, as well as near McIntosh Lake. So not a surprising kind of array of spatial comments, but this will be really crucial as we start to dig into recommendations. And then when we move to prioritization of those recommendations, we'll be bringing community input back in to make sure that we you know, prioritize locations where there's the most community support. Um, so a breakdown of who we heard from, um, you can see here kind of a, an accurate representation of Longmont. There are some missing groups or some underrepresented groups that we're making sure to reach out to, but just to show that we're looking at the demographic breakdown of who we heard from to see who we did not hear from, make concerted efforts to reach out to those groups. Um, so some of the responses to the 409 survey responses, uh, most folks who responded drive alone. Um, this mode split is, is also reflective of Longmont, but we want to hear from the community of folks who are walking and biking more. So it's a lot of our focus group outreach over the, the spring and summer. Um, so we asked folks for each mode, what is your biggest challenge for that mode? So uh, for people walking and rolling in Longmont, crosswalks and sidewalks are the biggest gaps. So that'll be a focus of, of our recommendations for pedestrians. And then for biking and scooting, kind of this general comment of people don't feel safe biking or, or rolling. Um, a lot about trails too, where people wanna see gaps in trails fil completed, access to trails improved, crossings of trails to become lower stress. And then on the transit side, making sure that coverage is addressed. So um, a point-to-point -point micro transit service or more on-demand micro transit service really addresses the most common response that we heard here. And then frequency of transit as well. And then concerns about driving is congestion. So this is something that, you know, as we draft our vision and goals, framing what the, the vision is for, for driving um, in Longmont and how we use transportation demand management and build up the multimodal network to shift trips from driving and provide alternative options is going to be a, a key way to address this concern. And it's interesting, going back one, the second response is there are no challenges in driving in Longmont, which is interesting too. Um, and then prioritization. So I was starting to think about what's most important, limited funds in the, the city, um, opportunities to find additional resources, but given the current uh, funds, where do we want to prioritize investment? So the most popular response is focused on biking, connectivity and comfortable options, and then third is improving traffic flow and, and congestion. Um, we had a lot of open-ended responses as well, so just wanted to capture some of those that weren't in the multiple choice. Speeding, uh, a lot of uh, conversation about enforcement, increased enforcement. Um, inclusivity of all modes. So reinforcing the vision of this effort before we kicked off, which is prioritizing walking, biking, and transit. And so really consistent community feedback about creating a multimodal plan and a multimodal vision for Longmont. Jumping into existing conditions. So we collected street light data, which uses um, 
connected vehicle data to understand where are people coming from and going to. We split that data into two pieces. We looked at regional travel patterns, those who are coming to Longmont from outside of Longmont, where are they coming from? And then we looked at local travel patterns of those traveling within Longmont, what are their origins and destinations? So a, a snapshot of those regional travel patterns, we're seeing you know, the thickness of the lines on the left, that a lot of folks are coming up the 119 corridor, coming from Boulder, a lot of people coming south from Larimer County, and then a lot of people coming from the northern part of Weld County as well are probably the most common destinations. We split up destinations to the south into a number of different kind of sub areas. So those lines are a little bit thinner based off how we broke off broke out those um, geographies, but interesting to note that the, the southern destinations are less frequent. And then we looked at the destinations in Longmont for those regional trips. So this was a little bit surprising that the North Main and South Main zones have a, are lower on the destinations. Together, they make up less than a quarter of those regional trips. The most common destination for trips coming from outside Longmont are to the southeast and the southwest. Those geometries or those zones are a little bit bigger. Um, there are a lot of regional destinations in there as well, but something that we're breaking down because the streetlight data we use just as vehicle data. So these regional trips are likely being made um, on transit or in a vehicle, but uh, wanting to think about walking and biking trips as well, especially when we look at local travel patterns. So out of all of the trips being made, 70% of trips start in and in Longmont, so a lot of short trips. We're seeing a lot of those trips being driving, so a really great opportunity to shift these short trips to walking or biking. Yep, exactly. So 77, over three quarters of them are between one and five miles, which we consider to be kind of within a bike shed. And then 11% less than one mile considered to be within a walk shed. And then you can see on the right, the thickness of the arrows reflective of those origin destination patterns. So again, North Main and South Main didn't come up. We think kind of getting some bicycle and pedestrian um, big data to, to better understand those travel patterns will help us. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. <clears throat> that 11%, is that part of the 77 or is that an addition to? Um, great <coughs> question. I think that's, a, that, that's in addition to, because we framed it between one and five. So it's okay. quite a high percent so that 88. are less than five when you sum those together. Okay, so 88 is less than five miles. Yeah, and long miles not that big, so. But <laughs> Um, so I've got a, a map of each mode. So for the roadway network, we're showing speed here. Pretty intuitive that the arterials are going to be your higher speed streets and um, also have, have higher volumes. And then we looked at travel speeds. So um, got some great data from the city of Longmont on speeds during the peak hour and speeds during the off-peak hour. So the lightest pink shows the difference. So you can see which corridors in some have the most congestion. And so this is by speed. So um, can start to see that it's pretty similar uh, in both directions on most corridors. The high 66 eastbound has the biggest difference in peak and off-peak speeds, Ken Pratt westbound, um, but not too dissimilar across these arterials. Bicycle network, so we mapped the, the bike facilities. Next step is to create what's called a level of traffic stress map to understand based on the speeds and volumes of the roadway, is this facility considered comfortable for all ages and abilities? So great to know that there's a, a pretty connected network, but a lot of these roadways, especially with bike lanes um, or bike routes, need to be upgraded to make sure that people feel comfortable of, of all ages. The pedestrian network, um, not that many missing or deficient sidewalks, so our recommendations for the TMP and the pedestrian network are going to be through a pedestrian prioritization process to understand which parts of the city is there the most demand for walking? Are there the most, are there the largest percent of the population that are vulnerable users, would that be because of age, um, mobility challenges, access to a vehicle? So overlaying that prioritization over where the missing sidewalks are so the city can begin to prioritize where to upgrade sidewalks and fill in those missing gaps. And then the transit network, both regional and local routes, transport and RTD. 
and then flex ride polygon was lit overlaid with that um, and then ridership as well so we can see the bolt um, highest ridership some of those regional routes and then the two stops in of the flex route what ridership is in those two compared to each other and then across from 2022 to 2023 as well pretty similar ridership and then collisions. So we have a map of pedestrian involved collisions and bicycle involved collisions. Both look pretty similar with uh, the highest density of collisions taking place on Main Street, which makes sense based on destinations. And then similar to the pedestrian involved with a few key hotspots at, at specific intersections as well. So as the Vision Zero plan progresses, it's going to be really important to bring in crash data, both where the crashes are taking place, severity of those crashes, and the cause of crash to start to break down crash patterns, come up with countermeasures to be able to address and reduce those crash types in particular. A breakdown of crash types. So most crashes are rear end crashes, which tend to be low severity. So thinking, again, as I mentioned, not just about where those crashes are happening, but where the severe crash is happening um, and those fatal crashes to be able to invest resources in those locations at a higher priority and think specifically about the recommendations in those locations. So the TMP will be working closely with the Vision Zero Action Plan, obviously two are very related. Uh, and then just to go over next steps, we have uh, draft vision and goals that we're working with Phil on collaborating based off of what we heard from the community and then recommendations for each mode and then coming up with policies and programs as well that are, are multimodal in nature. We'll be coming back to the stakeholders and to the community to present these draft recommendations for feedback. Any questions or Phil, anything to add? Nothing to add for me. I just uh, really appreciate the, the presentation and there's some new slides in there that I haven't seen. So it's exciting <laughs> to see the, the new stuff too. So you can see there's been a lot of work put into it so far. Obviously a lot more outreach. This isn't the end and end all be all for their outreach. We're doing a lot more events. One of them is uh, coming up April 20th, I believe. So um, we'll be out there more and more as you as the weather gets warmer. Why don't we start, um, Taylor, if you have any comments? Um, I, don't, I don't really have a comment. I'm, I'm excited for this process. Uh, the one question is because kind of at the beginning of the presentation, we focused on Envision Longmont. And, uh, you know, a comprehensive plan kind of gets reviewed every 10 years or so. How does that then transform itself into the TMP, but then also looking into the future. Um, is this a 10 year process that we're looking at or, or, you know, I like to think of it as ongoing and we're constantly learning and improving. So and just any comment on that. And communities generally tend to update their transportation master plan every five to 10 years, depending yeah. on how changes, how rapidly changes have taken place. Phil, I don't know. Um, no worries. <laughs> How the comprehensive plan, the timing for the next update to the comprehensive plan. They're often TMP and comprehensive plan done together, but also not not always the case. Sorry to leave you, Carly. That was no worries. <laughs> that was not correct. That was impolite. Um, but I did want to just say that uh, usually they are done at the same time. You, you're correct, but they. This time we did have to take them apart because we felt like the comprehensive plan and the land use pieces really had, they have an amendment process. And so those go through amendments as needed for the land use piece of it, but we don't amend the transportation component. So that's why we felt like we needed to do this one more recently. And if there's other parts of that question that I missed, mm -hmm. feel free to restate them and I'll answer them better, hopefully. No, you, you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't really have any specific comments or questions because I asked my one question I had. Um, it, the data is pretty interesting. I'm not very surprised by it, just from my experience of traveling around Longmont. But it's nice to see that you kind of collected the data that I'm kind of see all the time. So that was good to see.
Yeah, thanks for that uh, presentation, Carly. The, um, the outreach program is very impressive. And I noticed that um, there were a thousand engagements and the arithmetic is pretty simple since Longmont has about 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. Based on your experience, is 1% participation pretty good for a survey of this type? Yeah, it really varies. Um, in some of the smaller towns that we work in, in the mountains especially, we get a higher percent. Denver, Fort Collins, we get a lower percent. So I'd say that's kind of average for, um, for the city of Longmont kind of type of community, if not on the higher end. So anecdotally, especially at the open house, we saw more in-person attendance than we see in most of the communities that we work in, uh, and then pins on the map as well. Hmm. Interesting. So, hmm. I looked through the, <clears throat> the comments on the online survey, and it seems that most of them were pretty small scale and focused on the here and now, what people encounter in their day to day travels right now. In fact, I submitted a comment like that myself. <laughs> but it seems like planning is about looking forward and thinking about the future. So I'm wondering if there's some sort of way for big picture or futuristic concepts to be included in the TMP. And if so, where would they come from? From mm -hmm. the consultant or from staff or does that not happen in this type of uh, planning? Well, I, th I, th I think it's a combination of both. Uh, we, we listen to the consultant and they have some ideas with what they've seen in other cities that have worked or might be something we need to consider. Um, we did talk earlier about the train piece. Obviously, that's one of those things where we're going to incorporate that into our planning document and start talking about how, you know, a, a transit center it's not that far off anymore. It used to be, you know, 20 years off, and now it's two years off, hopefully, at the most. <laughs> and that's for bus rapid transit and for trains. So we know it'll cover bus rapid transit at least uh, for sure. So, um, but those bigger concepts, I think those higher level concepts, we're really just trying to stick with within maybe a five to 10 year time frame at this point to really have this key in on the uh, capital improvement program and how we prioritize those projects coming up fairly quickly. So that was the purpose of what we're doing here. We still have that longer range piece that's part of the MTIP that we talked about that's part of the Envision Longmont process. Mm -hmm. So that has a lot of that bigger vision piece and we'll probably keep a lot of that as we move forward with this plan. Unless we hear differently from the public and from the different boards and commissions that there's a bigger target out there or some, some higher level of, uh, of thought that we need to start taking on. But we're assuming that a lot of that's still in place for the longer range piece, but for the five to 10 year range, we really wanna start zeroing in on projects that are gonna start addressing the vulnerable population issue and flip the idea of always doing kind of, you know, what's best for the automobile or the, the roadway user in an automobile, a single occupant vehicle, and to kind of flip that as the bottom priority, because that's what we're hearing from all our policy folks, including this board. Um, that you want to talk about the pedestrians first, bicycles, transit riders, and maybe there's a freight component after that, or, well, obviously the transit component, the freight, and then maybe single occupant vehicles. So we're at least changing the narrative a little bit, but I don't think that gets to your longer range piece. But um, if, if we hear things, or if you have any ideas of what we should be looking at, let us know, and we'll see how we can incorporate those. Yeah, I was just wondering if there would be a scenario planning type part of this plan. I've heard stories about cities that were completely um, surprised by scooters appearing on their streets overnight, things like that. And it got me to wondering um, if, say within two years, if um, fully autonomous vehicles became ubiquitous, would Longmont have a downtown uh, parking and curb management strategy or plan in place to handle that? Or what if, uh, what if it became possible and there was a demand for uh, Vance Brand Airport to be an air taxi hub or for the airport to be a drone package delivery center? Does this, could this plan accommodate that or do we only react to things and say, well, we'll address it in the next plan? Mm -hmm. 
Well, all those things we have talked about as part of the planning process, so we are talking about them at least. Uh, we'll see at what level they enter into the plan, but I think that we're really thinking about, especially the dynamic curb piece of that, where you really need to like think, rethink your curb space, especially along Main Street here, where we have a lot of places that um, it's getting more and more difficult to get into them as for ADA access. We're talking about micro transit that's going to be very close to an Uber Lyft type system. Where are those people going to be dropped off as far as location to where they need to be and how dynamic that curb is as far as is it just parking or is it something else on top of it? Um, and then we've talked about the airport quite a bit um, with this plan, but we've also couched that as we're really looking at the surface transportation. So it will re really be the the connection to the airport area and getting people to and from or packages to and from the airport. But um, we feel like we have all the infrastructure in place for that and we've made some pretty significant improvements already. But uh, in autonomous vehicles, we talk about that as well, but it turns into how is that gonna, how is that gonna change realistically with all the, with the curb space it does change, but with the number of lanes and those kind of things. We're, we've got a policy directive to really not increase the number of lanes in this town uh, in the in the future, in the near future and the long-term future. So we're trying to stick with those policies and make all this work within those. And there'll be an emerging mobility section that will talk about these changes and trends of travel patterns, what we anticipate to come in the next five years, knowing that you don't update this plan every year. So how can we make sure it, it doesn't go stale and kind of we're setting long run up for success um, in the next few years to come? So there are a lot of great policies that you can start to think about putting in place in advance of autonomous vehicles to kind of set the community up for success and um, the roadmap for um, kind of related to greenhouse gas emissions as well, so fleet electrification. Um, and so a lot of things as we look forward into changing technologies and transportation, how to kind of create that foundation for Longmont. Okay, great. I'm happy to hear that staff and the consultant team are, are kind of looking out into the future. Um, I don't have any comments really, just a question. For the next steps, it says reach back out to stakeholders and community members for feedback. What does that look like? Yeah, so similar to what we did in phase one, we'll have an open house uh, mm -hmm. and we'll have a virtual component that consists of an online map where we share the draft recommendations as well as surveys to get uh, feedback from folks as well. And then these focus group meetings that um, we've been having in phase one. So those are, oh, and then intercept events where we go to an event where the community mm -hmm. is already um, to capture a broader you know, cross-section of, of community members who might not attend an open house. So that same multi-pronged approach that we've taken um, in the, the winter for phase one, we'll take again in the phase two element. Okay, and would this include information just regarding the feedback from the survey or possibly um, answers for people regarding existing plans that are in place for some of their concerns? Yeah, I think Engage Longmont's been a great platform for the latter that Phil's been very responsive to. Right, we've been responding as soon as we can to all those different questions on Engage, and so we've been pushing people to, to that site. Mm -hmm. On that site, we also have all of our existing plans and different things you can kind of research as far as looking up where we are today mm -hmm. before this plan is complete. Cool. Awesome, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have a question, but um, it's probably a little bit of a comment because I, I just I wrote down three things that kind of struck me, and I think there's opportunity here. The first was the idea that 77% of the trips are driven along, and I'm assuming that's cars. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing I saw, of course, speeding, and and then the the last thing was the 88% of the trips. Um, Thank you for the extra 11% <laughs> to that. Yeah. Um, are five miles and less, so there's some opportunities here, right? Uh, whether it's public awareness um, and, and getting that out to, you know, possibly the, the shorter trips, either whether it's pet uh, or bike. And, and then the idea, of course, driving, uh, which I don't know how we move the needle on the first part, driving in a car. Right, that's going to be very difficult, no matter how much we change the paradigm. Mm -hmm. But I think these two other things, we have the ability to make some public awareness that hopefully would affect that, that, that first thing. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So that's my only comment and, and question about, you know, I know the speeding side of it. We can't really address that in the TMP so much as, as it just being a concern and something we'd like to look at. Um, are there any other things around um, speeding that, that we're looking at other than obviously posted limits and all that? I know we've talked about red light cameras and I don't want to go there, but. Yeah. I mean, change to roadway design is yeah. going to be a big part of the TMP. Road diets that, and that sort. Yeah. yeah. And, and just kind of visually narrowing our roadways, um, curb extensions, kind of the suite of treat treatments that are really going to be important to supplement. It's not just enforcement, but making our, our streets feel more comfortable or feel like those the drivers need to drive at a, a slower speed as well. Yeah, I would say during our Vision Zero pr planning as well, um, both the TMP and Vision Zero will go hand in hand. Um, so. As far as speeding, uh, congestion, um, as well as safer signals with um, bikes and peds, um, we'll be continually updating those and looking for safety improvements um, as both these plans progress. But then once these plans progress, um, we'll be presenting more ideas and um, feedback for uh, changes on our roadways. Great. Thank you. Thank you as well. as a good, great presentation. Phil, any more information items? No more information items from us, um, but we'd like to move into the action section. Yeah, that's the 287. Yeah. <laughs> so to to start off, I, I just wanted to um, Landon. All right. Um, so Landon is going to do the presentation for this. Um, U.S. 287 Vision Zero and, and Mobility Study. Um, either way, however you feel comfortable. You can sit. You can stand. I'm happy to sit. Okay. What, what do you prefer, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. You can sit. I'm going to stand. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. <laughs> so I'm trying to find your... Uh, there it is. So the the... Push button thing should work at this point. Maybe not. Or maybe this works. Yep. Yeah, that's good to go. Okay, good. Thanks, Phil. Hello, everyone. My name is Landon Hilliard. I'm a senior transportation planner with Boulder County. Go ahead again. Try that again. <laughs> Hello again. I'm Landon Hilliard, Senior Transportation Planner with Boulder County, and I'm here with my colleague, Alex Hyde-Wright, who's the manager of the Regional Multimodal Transportation Division with Boulder County. And together, we have about a 20-minute presentation that we'd like to walk through with you. Um, if we see uh, our eyes fluttering, we'll speak more quickly. And um, uh, if you would hold the questions till the end, I think we'll have time for discussion after that. Okay, uh, I'll start with the origins and the content and the findings of this project. And then I'll pass it to Alex to talk about the meat of the project, which is the safety analysis and recommendations. And maybe there are a few themes that you can listen for about this presentation. And one of them is that US 287 is a key corridor, both for local and regional travel. A second is that it is, uh, uh, how, how would I say, um, growing and evolving fast. So we need to adjust to the changes. And the third, and perhaps the most important, is that there's serious safety issues that you all are aware of and that Alex will talk in detail about. OK, with that. There we go. All right. we've got a group of stakeholders that represent uh, different le levels of government. You see Longmont there situated between Lafayette and Erie, all the way up to the national level of the F FTA. And uh, this group has formed a coalition over the last several years that has uh, an interest in coordinating planning, evaluation, and advancements for US 287. The coalition meets uh, quarterly, Phil is a regular there. And uh, we, uh, it's all about collaboration. So I didn't tell you, but it's a bit of a surprise here. This is a two-for-one deal. We're, I'm going to talk briefly about phase one of this project and phase two leading up to things. Uh, 
So what's important about US 287? Broadly speaking, it has social, economic, and environmental significance. And if you look at the details, we're talking about things like air pollution, traffic congestion, and safety and mobility. And growth, as I mentioned, is a big part of this. A 20-year horizon done by Dr. Cog, modeling for traffic and land use, shows an increase of population and jobs of 75%. So according to the statistic, we have about 150,000 people living in this study area. In 2024, uh, uh, 2045, it could be as many as more than a quarter of a million people. About 10 years ago, RTD led a study called the Northwest Area Mobility Study. It goes for NAM, says so short. And in that study, it identified US-287 and the study area that we're talking about as a key corridor. Prime, uh, in a primary reason, because of centrally located, and basically it's a backbone for connectivity. North-south, obviously, but also east and west. And so the phrase that we use to describe the importance of this corridor is everywhere to everywhere in terms of mobility. So here's the first part of the two for one. Uh, the bus rapid transit study, uh, feasibility study that preceded the safety and mobility study. The objectives had to do with understanding travel demand and um, making recommendations for infrastructure improvements that would support better transit. This is a schematic of the service patterns. And note, from Fort Collins to Denver could be a one-seat ride. But just as important are the local trips between communities. Again, uh, the, the importance of US 287 tying communities together. And this shows uh, inve possible investments and patterns of routes. From pu public participation, we learned what you might expect, which is connectivity is key. Also, multimodal connections to transit and otherwise, and safety. So now getting to the meat of things, this is phase two, which is the safety and mobility study. And a little bit of background. As I've mentioned, the study area come, goes from Broomfield in the south, 24 miles to Longmont, basically where the border of Larimer County begins. And what's interesting here is the variety of land use context, urban, suburban, and, and um, rural. We think rural will probably stay tight given the open space regulations, but What's changing rapidly is the feeling of urban and suburban. A few years ago, Dr. Cog identified this as a high um, injury corridor and a critical corridor. It took about 15 months to complete the study. And in December 2023, we uh, posted a final report on the Boulder County website. And that's the basis of which Alex and I are talking to you about tonight. That study, again, is available. All uh, 2,000 plus pages of the appendix, too, if you'd like details. Uh, for public participation, we use a, a variety of methods and it went as extensively as possible. So, online pinpoint maps, online surveys, and then focused outreach. However, we did have one setback where a postcard sent to residents along the corridor in the old fashioned US mail had a 0% return. So when we go back to the drawing board, uh, we're going to think closely about public participation and, and, how, and how to gather more information. That's not to say that we didn't pick up valuable information, but that's just was one of the hiccups. The, the results from the public participation confirm what we thought, which is safety stands out. Also important are the uh, first and final mile connections to transit, improving intersections in a way to reduce traffic congestion, and then moving into the interest in having a walk-bike path that's separated and comfortable for people for local trips and longer commuting. So to wit, uh, a walk-bike path survey was introduced. Though almost everybody is, uses the automobile as a primary mode of transportation, there was interest in using um, the facilities if they were safe and comfortable. So about three quarters of the 60 people were, would, be, would use the bicycle facilities if they were appropriate. 
This initiated a feasibility study. And this is a map that's not meant to for you to read closely. It's just for you to understand the, the extent of what we're doing, which basically is uh, an inventory of existing conditions over future conditions, including bus rapid transit locations and uh, a white walk bike path alignment. And we know that there's interest from Longmonters in a connection by bicycle from Longmont to Lafayette and back and forth. So that's one of the primary reasons that this feasibility study was carried out. There are impediments along the way. The environmental analysis uh, showed that there are low-lying areas, need for public um, uh, utility relocations, historic sites, and so forth, considerations that would have to be taken into account. In the end, the alignment on the west side of US 37 between Longmont and Lafayette was the chosen um, uh, placement for that walk bike path. Of course, uh, there's much more work to be done in the walk bike path area um, for planning, design, and uh, funding. However, because we think that there's a low impact environmentally, it's likely to miss the environmental assessment, which causes a, a great deal of extra work. So again, that was just an overview of phase one, the BRT feasibility study, and an introduction to set the stage for Alex to talk about the Vision Zero Safety and Mobility Study, which he will do now. And I'll sit down. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you, Landon. Um, my name is Alex Heider. I'm the Regional Multimodal Planning Division Manager for Boulder County. And I'm going to talk about the safety analysis and recommendations that we identified as part of this study. Um, so as Landon said, um, the US 37 corridor is a dangerous roadway. I think every jurisdiction that's ever looked at this corridor has identified more or less that same high level conclusion, whether that was the Boulder County study, the city of Longmont, or the Denver Regional Council of Governments as part of their regional plan. Um, I'm not going to read all the statistics, but US 287 stands out in all of Boulder County for the number of serious injury and fatal crashes. Um, and unfortunately, this problem is only getting worse. Um, so this plan is both a set of recommendations as well as a call to action uh, and underscoring the urgency of the work ahead of us. Uh, for the crash analysis, we looked in detail um, at the different segments of US 287 uh, as Landon alluded to, uh, the land use context varies, and we have truly rural, suburban, and urban adjacent land use context. And so we divided uh, the US 37 corridor into a number of segments according to their adjacent land use. I'm just showing uh, an overview of the crashes along the or the intersection crashes along the corridor. Um, and then in addition to all crashes, we also looked at bike ped crashes. Um, and the purpose of these three images is just to highlight that the vast majority of bicycle and pedestrian crashes on the 287 corridor occur within the city of Longmont, which is the most urban of all the land use contexts in our study area. Um, looking at the safety analysis, uh, we used, uh, our consultant used a software uh, system called Diaxis uh, that looks at the different crash trends. Um, and the screenshot is just to show how one of those crash types was identified so that red box uh, down near the bottom identifies an approach turn uh, crash um, probability that those, those types of crashes are overrepresented uh, at the particular location um, that this report is for. And so for, uh, for all that analysis, we distilled the existing conditions down into a number of uh, common crash types. So left turns, um, against a, an oncoming vehicle or left turn conflict uh, with a bicycle or pedestrian, failure to yield, uh, right turn on red, a conflict between a vehicle and a bicyclist or pedestrian, and then a right turn uh, where the motorist did have the green light and a conflict between a bicyclist or pedestrian, uh, red light running or broadside, head on, rear end, fixed object, and side swipe crashes. And then for each of these common crash types, we identified recommended engineering mitigation measures, including signal improvements, signage, turning movement improvements, access management, bike and ped, and then a center median barrier. And so looking at um, 
how we structured these recommendations. So we identified where those common crash patterns are occurring at each of the intersections along the 287 corridor, and then paired each of those common crash types with those uh, key engineering recommendations that were from the previous slide. And then that call out on the right is showing an example um, of some of the detailed analysis for one particular intersection with the observations as well as the key recommendations. And those were identified for all of the intersections along the corridor. Um, and then just showing another one on the southern extent. Uh, in addition, we took a deeper dive at 12 locations along the corridor. Um, these were selected for both their high crash history as well as looking at a, a handful in each community. So several in Longmont, several in unincorporated Boulder County, several in Lafayette and Erie, and then a couple in Broomfield. And then just a zoom in of which locations we looked at within the city of Longmont. Um, for these uh, for these number of concept locations uh, within Longmont, uh, we were working with Longmont and CDOT. Alex, I'm, I'm sorry, can you go back to that last slide? Yes. I just wanted to see everything. Okay, thank you. Sorry no worries. Uh, so at um, these different intersections within Longmont, um, we knew that CDOT was all already working uh, with the city of Longmont. Um, CDOT had conducted an intersection prioritization study and was already working on several concepts uh, for intersection improvements at a number of the, the locations that we selected. And so this work was really building off of and confirming uh, the work that CDOT and Longmont were already doing in partnership. And then um, I'm going to show just one example. Um, so, so looking at um, US 287 and 17th Avenue, uh, we have a call out for the top countermeasures and then additional countermeasures. So just showing the detailed recommendations or the types of recommendations that we identified for these locations. All right, next I'm gonna talk about the center median barrier. Um, in the rural areas of US 27, so the about four mile stretch north of Longmont up to the Larimer County line, as well as the eight mile section between the city of Longmont and Lafayette, uh, we observed a very high number of uh, serious injury and fatal head on crashes resulting from drivers crossing the center median. Um, our study looked uh, broadly at three different types of potential median barrier to mitigate these crash types. Um, on the left, cable rail, in the center, guard rail, and then on the right, a cast in place concrete barrier. Uh, we also looked at the impacts uh, to emergency services operations um, because right now that center median functions as a left turn lane uh, for those private driveway accesses along the corridor with the median barrier in place, those left turns both into the driveways and then out of the driveway would no longer be possible. Uh, so to, act, to have a full movement access, you'd have to overshoot and then uh, make a U-turn at the nearest intersection downstream. Um, let me go back to that slide. Um, our median barrier proposal is to have uh, gaps in the barrier at all of the intersections in the rural areas, so both the signalized and the unsignalized intersections. And the intersection spacing is about every mile or so in those 12 miles of rural segments. Um, so it doesn't result in a huge amount of outer direction travel, um, but we do understand that for larger vehicle types, there's gonna be some impacts and that's um, an ongoing item for us to continue to work with those private uh, landowners and the farmers and the emergency services to figure out how to best accommodate those uh, large turning those large vehicles and uh, their turning movements. Uh, next steps on the median barrier. Uh, we've been pursuing grant funding for the construction of a center median barrier. Uh, we've submitted a couple different grant applications. Uh, unfortunately, none have been successful though far, so far, but we have a number of other opportunities in 2024 that we're continuing to pursue in partnership with CDOT. Um, elsewhere on the corridor, CDOT has been doing a pilot speed study looking at um, an alternative uh, means of setting the speed limit within uh, the city of Lafayette. Um, as you may be aware, a common technique is using the 85th percentile, which tends to drive the speed limit higher over time. Uh, and CDOT has recently developed a new protocol for looking at an altern alternative means um, that relies more on context to set the speed limits. And we expect the results of that study to be available later this spring. Um, we're continuing to explore uh, opportunities for speed photo radar along the US 287 corridor. 
Um, as you may have heard, there was a new automated uh, vehicle enforcement bill that passed in the legislative session uh, in, the, in the previous session, uh, and we're working with CDOT and other partners to identify if there's opportunities to pursue that uh, in addition to or as an alternative to um, officer enforcement on the corridor. Uh, we have uh, coordination between CDOT and Longmont uh, to continue the design and implementation of the intersection recommendations within the city of Longmont, as well as working with CDOT on traffic signal timing improvements and visibility enhance enhancements. And with that, uh, we are request our requested action of TAB tonight is to recommend that the Longmont City Council endorse the US 287 Vision Zero Safety Study. And with that, uh, Lane and I are happy to take any questions you might have. I've got a, just a couple right off the top. Um, <clears throat> with the countermeasures, um, such as no right on red and the yield to pet or bike, and those sorts of things. Is there any data that talks about these types of countermeasures, how long it takes for them to be adopted or integrated by the actual driving public? I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, you know, with any changes, there's a certain, say, break-in period. Um, it's a radical break-in Because <laughs> no, no right on red, I know, is fairly controversial in some other areas. So I'm just curious if, if data is being gathered around that. I'm going to defer to Phil and if there are any right turn on red locations within the city of Longmont already. Well, we just added one at, um, what's it called, Bounty, Bountiful Harvest Drive at, at Costco and 119. Mm -hmm. Harvest Moon, excuse me, thank you. So that northbound direction to one, at 119, because we couldn't add an acceleration lane, that's a no right on red, and it's taken some time. I'll be, uh, you know, I've been monitoring it. Kyle's been monitoring it. Um, it's taken some time for people to learn, but I, I think, so it's been through four months, five months since that's. Mm, year. Oh, geez, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, time flies. So it's it's taken almost, yeah, almost a year for people to learn that. So, uh, and we, that's without much enforcement at all. So that's another piece of this is that we're looking at different ways of enforcing those no right on reds. Great, thank you. Um, regarding center, median, barrier, you mentioned how it would be a solid concrete. Are there any discussions or possibilities of it being a more green or eco-friendly median barrier? Something where it's not entirely solid, it's something where things can grow or it's more open and more spacious to allow, you know, some grass, possibly. So the three types of barrier, I'll skip back to that. Uh, yeah. uh, the three types of barrier that we looked at within uh, the study would all fit within the existing, it's about 14 or 15 feet wide, uh, the striped median uh, that currently functions as the two-way left turn lane. Mm -hmm. So none of the options that we looked at would have required expanding the median because that drives a pretty costly expansion of concrete if you're adding uh, more pavement to the roadway. And with the number of contributing factors going into those head-on crashes, um, I don't have the, the breakdown in front of me, but it varies between drivers losing control on snow and ice, um, texting, distracted, drowsy, drunk, drugs, um, and I'm probably forgetting a couple. Um, but the long story short is that there, to really prevent all of those crossover crashes, we need a impenetrable barrier that's going to stop vehicles in their tracks that relying on rumble strips or other sort of softer features um, to, to divert folks back into their lane is not going to be sufficient to, um, to mitigate all of those crossover crashes. And I think with the, with the available space in the roadway or with the available space in the median that we have, um, we don't really have the room to do sort of a swale that you might see more in an interstate context uh, where there's just a lot more room um, for, uh, for vehicles to naturally come to a stop without some kind of low wall. 
Um, and then the other consideration is that CDOT, who would be responsible for maintaining any kind of median barrier, has a very strong preference for concrete uh, due to the nearly zero maintenance cost of it. It's basically you set it and forget it. Um, whereas with the cable rail and guard rail, it's cheaper initially, but there is an ongoing maintenance consideration because after drivers hit it, it has to go out and be fixed for it to maintain its effectiveness. Oh. Additionally, costs are, are a huge factor in this. Mm -hmm. And so as we're asking for grant dollars, to come back through there and have to dig out what's already concrete mm -hmm. and change that into something greener, though preferable, is going to cost a lot of money and add to the project costs, whereas putting the, the barrier median on top of that concrete mm -hmm. uh, is kind of the cheaper solution, mm -hmm. but more as effective. Okay, cool. Thank you. I was just curious. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's uh, it's a very impressive uh, study. The crash statistics for the Longmont uh, segment are shocking and sobering. And uh, I agree with you that uh, no time is too soon to uh, start addressing those safety issues. Now, did I understand you to say that the county's uh, safe streets for all grant application was not successful? That's correct. So we applied, uh, we saw it um, last year in the USDOT Safer Streets and Roads for All call. Uh, we asked for just under 17 million uh, for the 12 miles of concrete median barrier, and unfortunately, we were not one of the projects selected. Is there any other funding source secured for the median barrier? So right now we have about, I think, 4.4 million identified um, out of roughly 21 or 22 million total that we need. Um, most of that 4.4 million is money that CDOT has identified. Um, what's in their 10-year plan, which is essentially their version of a, C of a capital improvement plan, and then a little bit of strategic safety money that they've uh, identified. Um, they're also, we're working with the traffic engineering staff from Region 4, the CDOT region that includes Boulder County, um, to apply for some internal funding that's only available uh, to CDOT later this year. And so we're hopeful that um, in the next or in the remaining nine months or so of 2024 that we've got a few more opportunities to pursue um, some that are only available to the county, some that are only available for CDOT to apply to, some that we can both. Um, but between the two agencies, uh, our strategy is to leave no stone no, no stone unturned in seeking for funding. Just to ask, just real quick, can we leverage our congressional delegates to? kind of move this along because obviously this seems like it's affecting a lot of communities and we've got a single representative. That's Sorry. an excellent segue to one of the options that we're pursuing. Um, there is a, there's a, a current um, process uh, for submitting congressionally designated spending requests uh, to our congressional des uh, designation, um, more colloquially known as earmarks. and. The county has an internal vetting process where we're gathering all of the ideas and then the county commissioner's office is going to be deciding which ones we'll submit. Um, and so we have submitted a letter of interest to our commissioner's office um, to, to pursue this. And um, based on Commissioner Lochamin, uh, who represents the district covering Longmont, uh, it was her uh, recommendation or encouragement uh, to submit a letter of interest for this project. And so um, while it hasn't been determined which earmark requests the county will be submitting, we're fairly optimistic that this will be one of them based on already one of our three commissioners supporting it. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, going back to the funding, will the $4 million that's in hand be spent on barriers for high priority locations or will nothing get built until the whole $22 million is in hand? It's a good question. Um, it, there's kind of a, there's several options. Um, in order to leverage that four and a half million and secure more federal grant funding, we couldn't spend it now and then use that as leverage for later. Um, because if you, if you get a grant, nothing that you spent before your grant agreement is executed is eligible to be considered part of that. And to access almost all federal uh, transportation funding, you need to have some local match. And so right now our strategy is to 
uh, is to use that as leverage, which means that unfortunately we can't go out and spend it right now because we need to be able to, to show that we have available uh, to cover the general 20% required local match for transportation funding. Mm -hmm. David, on a positive note, the fact that CDOT is willing to put up nearly four and a half million dollars is an indication of the recognition of the urgency of the problem. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what's discouraging, and Alex could talk about this, is the vexing difficulty of finding funds. We've identified funds, but finding funds and actually scoring grant money to, imp to implement the median barrier project, which is odd given the um, great number of, of funding sources and volume of money that's available. Hmm. OK, um, you've explained the reasons for selecting a solid concrete cast in place center barrier. I'm wondering if uh, as vehicles become larger and larger and heavier and heavier and traffic speeds get faster and faster, has the design of that cast in place uh, median barrier been updated? It's a CDOT standard and I couldn't speak to the last time that they have updated it. Um, but my understanding is that it would be the same type of concrete barrier that they would use on an interstate application um, if, the, if the, the amount of deflection space that you have is too small to use another type of barrier. Okay, and those are um, steel reinforced cast in place concrete? I believe there's rebar in there, yes. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sir. Well, the, thank you for this presentation and, and thank you, board member McInerney, for those questions because those were my questions. <laughs> um, uh, specifically on the center median barriers. Um, and then I, I think uh, generally it's, you know, if it's hanging on a grant application, we may or may not see that this year, maybe next year, maybe the following. Is there anything that we could do in the short term in terms of what, what can we do tomorrow? Um, type of thing. So, mm. yeah. um, so one of our short-term items is that CDOT is working on using one of their continuing con uh, continuing services contracts to bring aboard uh, a consultant uh, to move into final design of the median barrier. And so our our study uh, was about a ten percent level of design, not enough to go out uh, for construction. And so CDOT is going to pick up where we've left off. Um, with one of their consultants and advance that into f uh, final design so that we have an ad ready package. Okay. And then uh, next question is the intersection improvements. Uh, I know what I'm suggesting is a complete overhaul of intersections. Uh, you know, I'm more roundabout friendly um, because of the stats uh, purely. Um, but is there any thought of that into the future? Maybe as we have to, you know, replace the road maybe we do a complete redesign uh, when, when that opportunity arises, um, if there's any thought behind roundabouts. Is that more for the city of Longmont or in the rural sections? Uh, rural sections, um, I would say at any, uh, because A, it will make it easier for turnaround for emergency vehicles. Um, also, you're more side swiping people instead of a head on collision. Uh, and there's less conflict points. Uh, and other countries have had experience with uh, it's called turbo roundabouts for kind of your highway areas uh, so just you know I, I just want to always kind of uh, envision and uh, invent uh, kind of the new the new thing that we mm -hmm. should be doing so well, I'll answer for the rural areas and then I don't know if Phil wants to jump in uh, for the urban areas within Longmont uh, we did look at roundabouts as part of the study um, and ultimately, they were not included in our key recommendations, I believe due to a combination of cost. Uh, we're rebuilding the intersection, um, given that we already have signals at the larger intersections, as well as right away. And then I think also with the speed on the corridor seat and the volumes on US 287, um, CDOT was not supportive of converting the larger intersections uh, to roundabouts. Okay. Uh, unfortunate in my mind, but we'll, we'll get there someday. So. <laughs> Yeah, and then commenting on to, you know, within Lamont, um, 287 is a pretty tight corridor as it is. Um, with 287, it's a large freight corridor as well. I would say it would be a hard ask with CDOT to convert some of those main intersections to roundabouts just between the right-of-way takes, spacing requirements, 
Uh, but I'll say outside of the 2A SMS, Longmont as a whole, um, you know, staff is entertaining um, several options and roundabouts is one of them for safety improvements of many intersections throughout the city. So um, you'll see more of those plans through Vision Zero um, as that plan comes together because it will require some community uh, engagement and consensus to uh, provide those improvements to those areas as they will drastically change in the future. All right, well, thank you. That's, I believe that's all I have for now. So thank you. Thank you. Well, um, Taylor kind of preempted my question about roundabouts, as no surprise. Um, I have a lot of experience with roundabouts have, having come from England and roundabouts are everywhere, including extremely fast roads, 70 mile an hour roads, so really common to have roundabouts, you just have multiple lanes and some of them even have traffic lights I've been on, those are the really fun ones. But I would love to see more roundabouts on the route and I think just based on all the safety issues and the things that Taylor has nicely brought up, I would just want to second that I would love to see roundabouts more considered, even within Lamont, but also on the rural areas because safety is really important as what we're talking about. Um, my other question was, uh, what's the next steps for BRT? So you did the presentation about BRT, what's the next step after where you are now? It's a challenging question. <laughs> um, US 287, for lack of a better way of putting it, is sort of third in line uh, with our NAMS corridors in terms of transit improvements. Um, so first in line right now is Highway 119, the diagonal highway linking Longmont and Boulder. Um, as you're probably aware, uh, later this year, CDOT is going to be going to construction uh, with several transit improvements um, and, and then also a commuter bikeway uh, linking Longmont and Boulder. Uh, next up uh, in all of our NAMS corridors is Highway 7 linking Boulder and Brighton. Um, obviously, that one does not go through the city of Longmont. And then US 287 is our third corridor in line. Um, so we don't have immediate next steps uh, for short-term <coughs> significant transit improvements on the corridor. Um, RTD is significantly limited in how much service they can restore uh, with their ongoing operator shortage. Uh, they're down by a significant share of their um, funded bus operator positions as well as their mechanic positions. Um, so unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of good news right around the corner in terms of how much service we can expect uh, from RTD. Um, I would just say there is reason for hope given the collaboration of stakeholders, including in Fort Collins, the Transport Public Transit Agency, that is uh, a willing partner and uh, runs the flex ride now. And so there is, as a platform, this collaboration through the coalition that allows us to think through options and draw on resources of stakeholders. So that there's, it's nothing definite, as Alex suggested, but uh, there is a launching pad to, to do better. And as we mentioned in the presentation, there's, a great ne there's more and more need for mobility by transit and to re reduce reliance on the automobile. Another bright spot um, that wasn't really in play when the original Northwest Area Mobility Study was done back in 2014 is CDOT. Um, and so at the time, CDOT was just getting into the transit business uh, with their bus tank system. And over the last seven or eight years or so has built out um, a rapidly growing and fairly extensive network of statewide transit and is now a significant player in the interregional and statewide transit game in a way that was almost unthinkable a decade ago. Um, and so we don't know exactly what opportunities might lie with CDOT, but CDOT is on the cusp of an update to their 10-year uh, plan, which is essentially their, their short-term transportation master plan uh, for the state. And so transit funding is a top priority for Boulder County and, um, and our communities. And so we're going to continue uh, beating that drum as part of the 10-year process. And so that um, might yield uh, some more funding and options um, that, that RTD is unfortunately not able to deliver in the short term. Okay, thank you for that mm -hmm. very detailed uh, answer. Um, I would love to see more transit, of course, because I would want to use it all the time, but I have to, I'm forced to drive because it just takes too long to get anywhere. So, um, my last question because I've, all my other questions have already been covered, um, is there was a lot of data 
in your presentation. I was just wondering if there's somewhere that we can go look at that information um, because we, it wasn't in our packet. So I was just wondering if we can see that information because there was lots of good information in there. Yeah, we have a, a website uh, on the, the county's website that has um, the full report as well as an executive summary and then appendices A through H, I believe, uh, a significant number of appendices um, and covering all manner of topics that we looked at. And we can share that, I think, through Phil. We did include it with your packet. So oh. the website was the was the attachment <laughs> uh, piece. So okay. that was the link. So sorry if that wasn't evident. So it your, um, yeah. Oh, okay. I, just, okay. I didn't spell that. Thank and you. Our, our website has um, both the phase one bus rapid transit study as well as the phase two safety study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And naturally, please feel to call, feel free to call on us if questions come up and you'd like to have some discussion. And we're open for that anytime. Thank you. So <clears throat> as David pointed out again, time is of the essence. So I guess um, really the best thing we can do is if we see the, obviously the validity and your statistics and what you're trying to do, we should be endorsing this uh, safety study. So are there any more Questions or comments? I've got one yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the roundabout idea just for a moment. You've explained that you considered it and rejected it. I recall you showed an image of uh, a, a U-turn turning radius at an intersection. I didn't look at it closely enough to be able to tell whether you're proposing expanding some of these intersections to accommodate the U-turns that are going to be generated by the median bar barrier. Can you explain that? So that's uh, something that will need to be resolved in final design for the median barrier. Um, we are probably not going to accommodate a, a WB67, which is a, the prototypical semi-truck, being able to make a U-turn at the intersection. The, the U-turn radius for those types of vehicles is fairly significant. Um, but what we're looking at is more how could we accommodate a single unit, um, you know, a standard 40-foot box truck, um, and if uh, a vehicle like that would be able to make a U-turn uh, from the left turn lane and still clear the intersection. And at some of the intersections, it will be able to. Uh, some of the intersections will likely require some modifications where the signal pole or something um, on the opposite side is, is in the way of the swept path. Um, and so there'll, there'll need to be uh, some changes there to be able to accommodate those. Okay, thanks. And David, just to follow up a bit about, we, we've spoken to the emergency responder uh, representatives, and evidently they use a kind of preemption system, I think it's called Opticon, uh, to be able to switch the lights that can allow through movement or a U-turn movement. So as far as emergency vehicle access and mobility goes, we're, co we're covered there. <laughs> if we could go back to that previous slide this the yeah the u-turn yep. so like is this purely for emergency vehicles or we we are we're also kind of planning for general uh people using the corridor uh both so um, one of our, our other next steps for the median barrier is to do more engagement uh, with the landowners and the farmers and other folks that are currently using the, um, the existing median as a left turn lane to access those private driveways. Um, we did uh, some outreach as part of the study, but we didn't get a great uh, level of response uh, from the landowners adjacent uh, to the corridor in the rural sections. And so we know that's an area that we need to spend uh, some more time and energy with uh, to really understand their needs. Um, there's a number of different ways to potentially accommodate uh, the movements that, as it stands, our median barrier would um, prohibit uh, those being you know, an alternate route where you could go around and make three rights instead of a left turn to mm -hmm. access the property. 
um, or you can make a U-turn at a downstream intersection, or if there's driveways where we really have a significant number of movements, um, potentially a gap in the median barrier at a private driveway. Um, but to figure out which of those is going to be appropriate, um, we really need to understand how many, what the, the left turning volume is uh, at all those at all those driveways, um, and understand what the needs are. And so that is um, an area that we'll be spending more energy on in, in the coming year uh, to really get a handle on on how best to accommodate those movements that we'd be restricting. Okay. Yeah, because I, I see kind of the, the general theme of this study is, is to reduce the conflict points that, you know, uh, reduce the head-on collision, uh, reduce, you know, the the drives, what we like to call strodes now. Mm -hmm. I think the Federal Highway Administration now acknowledges that term. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the U-turn uh, philosophy here, just I, I just think it might produce more conflict points. So maybe a light structure, may, maybe that's what fix it, but just just a thought. So thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, just to follow up on my roundabout point, <laughs> sorry to ask more questions. You talked about that um, cost was one of the uh, reasons why it was ultimately rejected. And I was wondering if the long-term costs, like, f for example, the signalizing is a, an expense. And um, how is, was that considered as one of the potential savings, not having to signalize at an intersection because you have a roundabout instead? Was that one of the... Co I d maybe you don't know, but I was just curious. So in broad terms, I think our study proposes to leave the existing unsignalized intersections unsignalized that we we looked at i think there might be one maybe two um, that we're proposing to signalize but for a number of the under, other intersections we did evaluate those uh, and the study revealed that they're not really close to meeting uh, one of the different uh, signal warrants that cdot would require to convert it to a signalized intersection um, and so for most of the intersections that are already signalized, they would stay that way. And then for most of the unsignalized intersections, there wouldn't be a cost to signalize since we're not proposing to signalize them. Okay, that wasn't actually my question. But oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was asking about, so if you did a intersection change to a roundabout, for example, you no longer have to pay to have those lights anymore running all the time. And that is a, there is a cost associated with that. Was that one of the costs that was considered as the pro point that that would no longer be a, a cost for that intersection because a roundabout doesn't require any electric. I am not sure off the top of my head if the maintenance and operations cost of the signal was factored into the roundabout um, consideration. Kyle, why don't you explain how much it costs to do a roundabout because of the right-of-way costs and those sorts of things that maybe we're not, we're not understanding. Yeah, so um, it could be a range um, so it's kind of generally speaking for smaller, maybe a, uh, two to four lane roadways. Uh, I might be talking if somewhere in the range of four to six hundred thousand dollars for a signal uh, for four approaches um, and all the equipment. For roundabout, depending on if there's right of way, um, that could be anywhere from one point five to two million dollars. Uh, so when we're talking about projects and spending, um, solar power will spend. You know, five hundred thousand dollars now, except the maintenance costs, maybe a few thousand dollars a year, um, versus spending the upfront capital of making a roundabout plus the years of construction. While a, a signal could be a few months of inconvenience, um, so a lot of those factors come into whether it's roundabout or signalization. So, and in terms of CDOT, um, since they're so flush of cash and have all this money for capital projects, usually uh, completing the ones that complete the needs of the project in the shortest amount of time with, with the littlest budget usually is the one that wins out. Um, so that's generally how it goes. Um, and so uh, if there's any questions about that stuff, I'd be happy to answer um, a little more specifics. Does that help in comparison to cost of signalization versus roundabout? Yeah, I, I mean it does, yeah. It's just you're almost putting a price on the extra fatalities you might potentially have at that intersection mm -hmm. for the cost of mm -hmm. implementing it. I yeah, mean, and, and part of the weighing is if, we, if they spend, uh, let's say this intersection, for example, um, this one would probably be upwards of two plus million dollars versus if they spent the money 
across the entire corridor, you're improving more sections of the roadway at once, so you're hitting more people, versus this one area is the only one that's getting improvements. So you look at a lot of the crashes we've had on 287, a lot of them been at different stretches of the road. Um, and so what happens is you make one improvement to one side of the road, but then because of lack of funding, you can't accomplish the rest of the road. And something happens there versus if you were able to complete a project like say the medium barrier at some good costs, you somewhat protect the road and maybe eliminate more of those fatalities. Um, so unfortunately on the 287 corridor, especially in the rural areas, it's not so much at a single point, it's the entire segment that needs to be addressed um, because the randomness of where those crashes occur are pretty evident from the locations versus when we look at our signalization, we know where those happen because those happen at the intersections. So we make those really big improvements at the intersections. So hope I answered your question on that one. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry to be keep driving. It's just, yeah, the safety differences is pretty considerable between the two, so thank you. Can we, uh, do we want to get a motion to approve the Vision Zero safety study on US 287, or do we need any more questions? I'll move that uh, <clears throat> the board recommend to council that the 287 Vision Zero safety study be uh, adopted, endorsed by City of Longmont. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry. No, I was just going to say um, that was our action item. Since we moved that down, we can move to to number eight, if, if that, and we can discuss the um, the the email comments on this. Perfect. We also have um, the woman who wrote, or the person who wrote the uh, email, in the audience, Jen Bell. And so, if if the chair sees fit, you could reopen the public invited to be heard. And have her speak to that. We'll, as yeah, common, I'm, as common with all our public in, our invites, right. we, heard, we do a five-minute um, maximum length on that. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, since we've all have a copy of it, I I would prefer to get our comments actually, if that's okay with Miss Bell, or if you'd like to speak and add additional commentary to this, that's fine as well. If you don't mind, I have a few thoughts after listening to the meeting. Okay. My name is Jen Bell. I live in the north of Longmont. I'm very excited to hear we have a transportation advisory board. <laughs> Honestly, did not realize that until yesterday. So um, since everybody has a copy of the email, I won't rehash all of the content. I mainly wanted to um, mention a few other things that I thought about during the course of observing the meeting. Um, the biggest of which is that I think there's lots of excellent discussion about uh, about the short-term fixes, especially with regards to safety. Um, I would hope that the board keeps in mind long-term vision at the same time as fixing the short-term problems. So when we talk about when we talk about signalization, we talk about no right on red. I think that taking the taking immediate action to improve the safety of our city is a fantastic move. Um, however, in parallel to that, I would hope that we're thinking about, you know what? It, what does that do to the city long long term? You mentioned the term of Strode. I quite free, I think I used it twice in the email. <laughs> um, I would hate I would hate to see um, measures on our on our cities turn roads into more of a slowed down blended environment as opposed to striking a delineation between this is a corridor. This needs to be 
fast and separated where pedestrians and cyclists aren't on it in the first place and establishing secondary routes that are very pedestrian forward, cycling forward versus trying to force everything in one spot and then having additional mitigation efforts, which slow it down even more, you, you kind of get my point. Um, I, I think that it's important to keep the short term and long term in mind in parallel. And if we're thinking about things that are going to be safer, but slow down the road, hopefully in parallel, we're also thinking about what could we do to route 287, not through Main Street in the first place? What if it went down Hover? I mean, I may be completely out of the loop and hopefully these are things everybody's already thinking about. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that of the keeping short term and long term in mind. I also wanted to comment on the, the median barrier that we talked about. Hopefully as part of that, we could leave small gaps so that gravel cyclists like myself don't become completely blocked along the highway. I crossed 287 yesterday on my ride. I think that gravel cycling around Longmont is one of the selling points of the city. We have fantastic gravel access, uh, which often feels trapped by the surrounding highways. If there's now a barrier that forces me to go several miles out of the way, that gravel, the wonderful gravel we have around North Longmont, East Longmont, Southwest Longmont, becomes inaccessible. So even if there's not going to be a gap for a car to turn left, we could have a small gap for animals, for cyclists to keep it from being a complete barrier. And having a, a median would make that crossing so much safer, but still an option. Let's see. Um, I also wanted to comment that, you know, I'm so excited to hear about all of these plans. I'm sad that this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the teams involved have been very diligent in getting things out to the community. So I'm sure this is mostly on me. I guess I'm just, I, I am wondering what, what methods we're using to engage the public. If I don't know about an open house ahead of time and have it on my Google calendar, I'm not just going to stumble upon that. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if there's a, there's a Facebook group I should be following or an Instagram or I don't even have a Twitter, right? There's a, a lot of this is probably me being out of the loop, but I, I would be curious, why was there not a single respondent under the age of 24 in the transportation mobility plan? What about high schoolers who want to get to school around here? What about middle schoolers? You know, what if we, do we ever want to attract young people who tend to have, tend more to flock to Boulder? I, I think all of those are all those are things that got me thinking, and I this seems like a very capable board, and I'm very excited about the teams that I heard speak tonight. Seems like a very competent group, so I, I don't throw any of this out as an accusation of incompetence. I just want to ask the question: of What am what am I missing as a citizen to become more engaged in this? Because I care a lot, <laughs> and would like to be able to help more. Um, let's see, I think, oh, and the one other thing I wanted to comment on, and I talked about this some in the email, but additionally talking about not all bike paths and not all, not all connectors are created equal. I've, I've biked along the connector parallel to 36 and it is a fantastic connector. I used it to commute to work for a long time and it's great. But the Lobo Trail, so much better because you're not right next to the road. Um, even having a strong buffer, the road noise can be stressful, especially for a new cyclist. So thank you all so much. Okay, so I think what we had talked about is we'll move to our comments and if anybody would like to address the, the email and these additional comments I think would be appropriate now. And I'll just start, um, Taylor, with you. Well, for, first off, for the two presentations, th thank you. You all did a great job. And now, you know, the other two left. Yeah. <laughs> As I say that, I realize that. Yeah. Um, uh, and then also for the public comments, th thank you, Jennifer. I, I, would, uh, I would recommend, you know, being keeping tabs on the TMP and the process. Uh, uh, you could even, because it, obviously it sounds like avid cyclists, so uh, there's also a bike issues committee uh, you could join. Um, that I would uh, email uh, Ben Ortiz to join on the mailing list. Uh, he's front row to talk to him. So, um, But yeah, just, just 
Anyway, and, and and the BIC, I'm, I'm a member of BIC. Uh, there, there's two of us here that are members. Uh, we're, we're working on some exciting things. Um, and, and I think generally the city is working on very exciting things. And, and that's why I'm here, because I, I want a better future. So, um, but thank you for your comments. And it was a great meeting today. Thanks. Um, so I want to thank the presenters who have already left. <laughs> Um, but super, lots of really good information today. Um, some of it was affirming of what I'm sure most of us have already experienced, but it's good to have the data behind what you're seeing um, every day. Um, as regards to your comments, Ms. Val, um, I am a only cyclist. I only cycle in Lamont. It's my primary form of transportation here, and I only drive when I really have to. Um, so. I have noticed all of the things that you talked about and I feel the same way as you do for, for most, most of the way. Um, I am part of the Bicycle Issues Committee, as Taylor said, and um, I, I strongly recommend if you really want to be um, more engaged with bicycling here in Lamont and have, have your say on where the city is moving, on which paths are um, being connected and how those connections are going to look like. Um, definitely consider joining because that's the conversations we're having as part of that committee as well as you know attending tab as well because we talk about bicycling almost every time so mainly because i'm here <laughs> okay thanks two good presentations tonight a lot of useful information <clears throat> i uh, also want to thank you Jen Bell, for your very thoughtful uh, comments and your interest in Longmont transportation. Yes, to echo what everyone's already said, very informative presentations. I did learn a lot tonight. And to comment on the email, I want to express that I resonated with it a lot because for me, I like walking pretty much everywhere. I live over at the corner of 3rd and Ken Pratt, those apartments over there. So that's a lot of new development happening. And when I first joined TAP, that's like the one thing I wanted to learn about what's happening around me, like what can I do? And I learned that uh, for County Line, that the new sandstorm marketplace that's being developed right now next to walmart they will be turning that into a crosswalk so that information is something i learned after joining tap so i don't know if there's a way to increase the awareness of existing projects that are happening but that would be something i would recommend because now that I have that info, I'm like, okay, well, it's going to be done. I don't have to be, you know, questioning what's the city doing. I could just wait it out and still run across really quickly while there's cars going by. So I really appreciated the email and um, thank you. Say it again. Great presentations um, <clears throat> by our guests who have left. Um, and you know, um, I, again, Ms. Bell, great email. Um, I think what's interesting is, is we touched on a lot of these kind of items within the discussion on the TMP as well as with the, the safety study. Um, and I guess the one thing that always comes to light for me when we talk about safety dollars and safety in dollars is the challenges, as Kyle mentioned, was we have an entire project that we're trying to make safe for everybody so putting all the money into a single improvement versus making sure that we do it for the whole thing is much like all the projects that we're trying to either endorse or look at. And I think that's just a challenge and it's a weighing of, yes, would it be nice to have a gap between the concrete barrier for animals and cyclists? But is that you know something that CDOT can't do, nor will they endorse, it's not part of their standard. It's just this balancing act of money versus you know payoff. And unfortunately, you're right, until Vision Zero, safety wasn't as much the consideration where I think we have kind of flipped that script a little bit. So um, Engage Longmont is a great site to go to um, for projects, right? We, we would have had the crosswalk on Engage Longmont. Is that right, Phil? 
that board member Kim mentioned? That's actually a little different spot, but it, we do have um, our current developments that you can go to and look at all the current developments for the city. Engage Longmont's a great place for the Vision Zero and the Transportation Mobility Plan. We also do a lot of advertising on, you have to, you, it's best to subscribe, but on Instagram, Facebook, and X are all places that if you just type in City of Longmont and start following the City of Longmont, you'll see all these different uh, chances to engage with whether it's next light, whether it's uh, you know a certain tr transportation project, or if it's planning, so there's a bunch of different things out there. If it's the library, even you know it's different different aspects, but it's a great place to get that information. It, and then I guess the last thing I would say in regards to all this is that if you are passionate about something like cycling and what have you, let your friends and neighbors know as well. And because the more that know about this, the the more conversation that could be had, the, the better it could be for everybody. So um, thank you, everybody, for a good meeting tonight. Um, items for the upcoming agenda. I think you had a list on your sheet there. Yeah. We yeah. still intact the... Uh, RTD planning update and then the 2024 CIP update. Correct. And, and then we'll probably have a um, third reminder, April 15th, not April yes. 8th. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or fourth reminder. Yeah. We Great. also plan on, uh, we have some parking code amendments that we might be talking about as well. We're changing the parking code to <laughs> maximums, not minimums, in a lot of different areas, but we're also cha changing some of the multifamily minimums. It's the last place where we have, where we're talking about minimums is multifamily and single family, but single family is pretty easy, but we'll just let you know um, about those. We'd like you to see them before council, but we're gonna, we're, we're gonna see about timing on that first. So we'll okay. let you know. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Um, okay, with that, um, I need a motion to adjourn. He's quick to the trigger, right? <sighs> Motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No? Great. Thank you. Have a good night.